Hello and welcome. To many of you, welcome again. For, I think for many of you, this is becoming like your second home for the occasional evening anyway. Um, for those of you who were it's the first time, my name is Gerd Nonnemann. I'm the Dean of Georgetown in Qatar, School of Foreign Service. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all. This is, this is what we do. This is what, uh, in addition to our research and our teaching, um, we want to reach out. We want to, to engage with the society around us here. And um, one of the things that we do as part of that is bring truly eminent people to come and discuss things with us, to bring us their perspective on a variety of things. Um, one of the most illustri illustrious guests we've brought is sitting right in front here, um, Jim Hoagland. Most of you, if not everyone, will be very familiar with him. Um, and I was going to, I could say, so I won't give him an introduction, but the actual reason, because he does deserve an introduction even if he doesn't need one, the actual reason I won't do so is because we have here at Georgetown another tradition, which is that um, we get one of our students to introduce such speakers, because our students are something that we want to showcase too. We're very proud of them. They're a fantastic group of young people who are going to make waves in this world and, and make, wa make change for the better. Um, so that's, that's one of the traditions that's become established here. And the student who's going to introduce uh, Jim tonight is Omar Hashim. Omar is a third year student, or a junior as we call him, in the international economics major um, here at SFSQ. He's also doing a, what many universities call a minor, what we call a certificate. We're different. And the reason I mention that is because it's, you might have seen it in the media earlier this year. It's the first joint certificate or joint minor between two education city universities. So it's a, it's a joint certificate in media and politics between Georgetown and Northwestern. The kinds of things one can do here in Education City that's not, that are not so easy elsewhere. So Omar is one of the first cohort taking this uh, minor. He came to us from uh, the Qatar Leadership Academy now three years ago, nearly three years ago. And he's also very active in another thing that we uh, uh, spend a lot of time and effort on, the, the Georgetown Model United Nations which incidentally, we've just been exporting now to India, and it's been a roaring success there too. So, over to Omar. Thank you, Dinanan. Honorable guests, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, good evening to you all. I would like to extend our dear gratitude to distinguished journalist Jim Hoagland for having accepted our invitation to be our distinguished lecturer this evening. Furthermore, it is indeed an honor and a privilege for me personally to be introducing our guest speaker this evening. As a media and politics certificate candidate, it is a rare pleasure to have such experienced and talented professionals share their real life experiences with us. Well, I know that I could go on forever introducing Mr. Hoagland, however, with all his accomplishments, however, I'll try to make this short. Jim Hoagland is a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize for the Washington Post, where he has, recent, we has spent four decades as a reporter, editor, senior foreign correspondent, and syndicated columnist. He is now a contributing editor, writing occasional opinions articles for the Washington Post. Born in Rock Hill, South Carolina, Mr. Hoagland graduated cum laude from University of South Carolina and did his graduate work at University, excuse me, uh, Aix-en-Provence in France and at Columbia University in New York. After living in Germany for two years, while a lieutenant in the US Air Force and became staff member of the New York Times International Edition editor in Paris in 1964. He joined the Washington Post in 1966 and served as the Post's Africa Correspondent, Middle East Bureau Chief and West European Correspondent. 
based in Paris for 10 years before rec returning to Washington as a senior editor. He began his syndicated column in 1986 from Paris. In 2002, the editor of the, New of the Times London, Le Figaro Paris, uh, Die Welt Berlin, and four other leading European newspapers presented him with the Kirbino Europa Prize for, exp for explaining the aftermath of 9-11 and its effects on US-European uh, relations. Our guest speaker for tonight is also author of South Africa, Civilizations in Conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jim Hoagland. Omar, thank you for that uh, very warm introduction. It reminds me of the story that Lyndon Johnson used to tell when he would say that if his mother had been here, if my mother had been here, she would be so proud, and if my father had heard that, he would be laughing his head off. <laughs> and I want to thank Dean Nonneman for this opportunity to offer you a few thoughts about the political state of the United States these days and to spark what I hope will really be a conversation. I was a little embarrassed when I discovered that the title of my talk tonight was a distinguished lecture. But of course then, after I've seen this audience and realize who you are, I understand it's the audience that distinguishes it. So I want to uh, thank you for turning out. And uh, we'll get to your questions um, and maybe some answers very quickly. The Middle East, uh, as my title suggests, represents a glass half empty to President Barack Obama, not the glass half full that seemed to capture George W. Bush's energies and attentions after September 11th, 2001. Now this image of a glass that contains enough liquid to give American presidents, much less other observers such as humble journalists, different conflicting but plausible perceptions is a useful symbol for a journalist to examine in a speculative talk since those perceptions that are formed shape the attitudes and the actions that follow. And it is a symbol that is also of use, I think many of you will know, to a number of other disciplines. Psychologists use it as a frame of reference that reveals whether the observer approaches the situation with preformed optimistic or pessimistic frames of reference. If we describe that glass as half empty, we have made a judgment that it is being drained and is on the road to liquidation. In business, that is called a wasting asset that will not return to its former abundant full state. I'll spend a few moments telling you why I think President Obama has come to see a region that he once saw as one that was particularly promising for his political gifts as having now reached exactly that state of seeing it as a wasting asset and seeks to form a new American containment policy. That is, a policy to contain greater U.S. involvement in the greater Middle East. Even though as my opinion, as an opinion writer, my job is to have opinions, that's what I get paid to do, I'm not going to tell you here at the outset if I think he is right or wrong about that. After all, I want you to stay engaged throughout my brief remarks and to come into the group discussion that will follow with your own thoughts and your own ideas. I tell people that I became a journalist primarily so that I could continue my education, that I could go out and find people who knew something about something else, who knew more about it than I did, and then to ask them questions about it. Here tonight, as we head for the discussion, I live in dread of being asked one particular question about domestic U.S. politics. I won't touch on it here, but we'll see if it gets asked. My most recent column in the Washington Post was about the importance of personal experiences and relationships on the largest policy questions that leaders have to deal with. 
on foreign policy in general. In his great novel, War and Peace, Leo Tolstoy spends a lot of time arguing that historians and journalists accord too much importance to the personal and to the will of the individual. The individual he had in mind mostly was Napoleon, of course. And no doubt, Tolstoy has a point. But it is also easy to neglect the role that personal experience does play in shaping official perceptions and policy decisions. It is important to know, for example, that John Kerry gave Barack Obama his first big moment on the national political stage by choosing him to give one of the keynote addresses at the 2004 Democratic Convention. It was a remarkable address, a fine example of this president's ability to use his oratorical powers to make other people believe in him and his cause. That was at the 2004 Democratic Convention. And if you understand that, you will understand why there is a bond of trust between the two men that was never established in the same way for Hillary Clinton, Kerry's predecessor as Secretary of State, who fought Obama for the nomination in 2008. This gives John Kerry more room to operate as Secretary of State, up to a certain point, as he discovered in the unmaking of Obama's decision to bomb Syria's chemical weapons in the space of an afternoon. My own personal experience with Hafez al-Assad in Syria helped me understand how his son Bashar was able to achieve more strategic gains in undercutting the Syrian opposition and Western support for the uh, Syrian opposition by giving up his chemical weapons arsenal than he could have ever made by using those same weapons on the ba battlefield. He understood when it was time to yield not only to the pressure of an American threat to bomb, but also to Russian pressure, as the Kremlin became concerned that Syria was spinning out of control. This was uh, the kind of personal experience that I noticed in the beginning of my career as a foreign correspondent. And it will give you perhaps an initial clue whether I agree with President Obama or not on the half-empty glass theory. I grew up in segregated South Carolina at a time when there were strict racial prohibitions in effect. It was against the law at that time for me to go to school with a black child in the United States. And I, I know fully well that when I came as a correspondent for the Washington Post to go to South Africa and spend six weeks writing about apartheid and the state of apartheid, that those childhood experiences shaped very much the disappointment and indeed the anger that I felt at South Africa's inability in those days to see where its best interests lay in giving liberty to all its people. Then I moved to Beirut and I got to know the Gulf and that was, it's a great pleasure to be back here. I spent time among others interviewing Saddam Hussein and becoming very involved in what became a very personal struggle with a brutal dictator. And I watched in those years that I was here in Beirut between 1972 and 1976, watch that region, your region, change dramatically. It's hard for most Americans to remember today, and I think for most other people to remember today, that the United States was once a marginal power in the Middle East. To remember that when Britain decided in 1967 to end its presence east of Suez, and tried to persuade the United States to become a regional hegemon, the United States said, no, that's not our job in the world. It was really only in 1967 with the 1967 war that Americans became, began to become involved in thinking about and eventually establishing a presence in the Middle East. In 1967, the ambiguous sentiment toward Israel that had been felt by and large by many American Jews was transformed by Israel's victory into an identification with and support 
for Israel. Shimon Peres, president and previous prime minister of Israel, captured that by saying shortly after the 1967 war that whereas France had originally been the major provider of arms to Israel, when Charles de Gaulle declared an arms embargo, Israel turned to the United States and for the first time the United States became a major and then the major arms supplier to Israel. Shimon Peres summed it up by saying our mirages suddenly became phantoms. Then in 1973, Anwar Sadat did a remarkable thing. He started a war on October 6th to make peace and to regain the Sinai Peninsula. As he was able to bring, and he set out to do this quite deliberately, as he set out to bring Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon into the Middle East, a kind of Pax Americana rough, it's a very rough uh, concept, but there was something that resembled a Pax Americana emerged in the Middle East and it is now coming to an end. It's worth reflecting for a moment on the fact that Nixon and Kissinger set out originally to remove the Middle East as a threat of being a theater of superpower and particularly nuclear conflict. The nuclear alert that was declared in 1973, during the 1973 war, scared both the White House and the Kremlin and convinced Kissinger, at least, that it was necessary to reduce the conflict in the region from a superpower one that could engulf the world in a nuclear war to the matter of Israel and Palestine and to try to secure a peace between those two warring parties. It was a deliberate attempt to atomize the Middle East conflict as it stood then. In many ways, this atomization of the Middle East has succeeded far beyond Kissinger's dreams. In fact, it now produces concerns about the implosion or factionalization of major Arab states. And from that, we in the West have to draw the concern as to whether or not implosion at some point becomes explosion. Global change makes it necessary to adapt the American role in this region. The mysterious, perhaps distant, personal qualities of the 44th President, Barack Hussein Obama, will help shape those changes as we move forward. I say the somewhat mysterious personality of our President. It's um, clear that he is quite a different kind of president than was George W. Bush. I remember right after one of President Obama's first meetings with a European leader, I had a chance in Washington, I had a chance to talk to that leader who immediately said to me, you know, he's different than George Bush. George Bush wanted to be liked by his peers, the other leaders. Barack Obama doesn't care. In many ways, it's uh, fair to say that Obama has had to play a weak hand left to him by the financial and political excesses of George W. Bush's two terms. But particularly here, near the outset of his second term, it is a fair judgment to say also that ha Obama has so far been more adept at managing adversaries whom he has sought to engage and occasionally to cajole than he has in managing allies. I have in mind Saudi Arabia, I have in mind Israel, and I'm sure we can add Germany to that list after the NSA got through with their exercises. Um, many of the allies that he has uh, neglected in many ways, or they feel that he has, they feel concerned, some of them feel abandoned. I'm thinking again, of John Kerry's trip yesterday to Saudi Arabia. Uh, that established a pattern in the first term. And uh, very much personal relationships, even if it's in the negative, even if it's the lack of personal relationships, have played a key role in Obama's approach to the world. Early in his first term, he reached out to China with the idea of establishing a G2 rather than uh, a G7 or 8 world. China wasn't interested. China didn't feel ready. Uh, 
didn't want to take on that kind of responsibility and had other matters more urgent for China. So feeling somewhat shunned by the Chinese, somewhat rebuffed rather by the Chinese, um, the president then turned to try to fashion a, an effective G20 built around a strong relationship with India, US and India. In part because, as he told me once, the president had found Mahmoud Singh to be the most impressive of all the foreign letter leaders that he had met up to that point in his first term. Uh, that, had, that did not work out when India was not able to deliver on the over, overly ambitious American goals that were set for that kind of partnership and when the G20 proved to be, from a political standpoint, fairly unworkable for Obama's goals. You know, the, the most telling incident I can think of to describe the president's personal characteristics and, and the quality that I'm talking about is told in my colleague David Marinus's book, Barack Obama, The Story, in which David Marinus went and interviewed people who'd known Barry Obama as a child and as a college student. And among those he interviewed were several of the young women that Barack Obama took out on dates and formed relationships with. And David Marinus interviewed one girl who told him about the moment when Barack Obama and she were sitting quietly talking and she said to him, I love you. And he said to her, thank you. <laughs> I tell that as, as uh, what I think is a telling um, incident, anecdote, x-ray, if you will, that we have a president who expects to be liked in many ways. I think people in the Middle East got a sense of that when he first came to Cairo. He gave a terrific speech. Again, he gives brilliant speeches by and large. And then uh, promising Middle East peace, suggesting that he was going to put his shoulder to the wheel to produce it. And then quickly retreated when both Arabs and Israelis refused to immediately offer the concessions that he felt each had to make in order to move the Middle East peace process along. He left the impression, I think, that the Middle East was simply too hard, that it would require too much effort, and that he had other things to do. In fact, the whole pivot to Asia idea that he has announced, or, or, or his State Department has announced, actually, but he has supported, the pivot to Asia gives me the impression of a man running from a burning building, of wanting to get out of the Middle East, get out of Iraq, get out of Afghanistan, um, looking for a calmer area to practice policy in. Moreover, in the United States today, there's a lot of talk about the American energy revolution, about the U.S. becoming a net energy exporter. Now, this was not planned as a way to extricate or reduce American presence, leverage, involvement in the Middle East, but since it is there, since the shale oil and shale gas revolution is taking place, it is seen as a way of lessening American dependence on the Middle East. I recently had a talk with a former Secretary of State who summed it up by saying five years from now, the United States will be much less dependent on Middle East oil, and China will be much more dependent. The Middle East will become a problem for the Chinese to have to solve. I think he was deliberately overstating to some extent, but it does reflect a strain of opinion, both in this administration and in the country. This was reinforced just last week. I, I don't know that you will have uh, seen it because not much attention was paid to it, but I thought it was extremely important. Susan Rice, the President's National Security Advisor, gave her first interview, her first major interview, to the New York Times, alas, if you'll pardon the expression, that focused on a review that she had just been conducting of Middle East policy. And Susan Rice stated the result of that review to be that we had resolved that we cannot let one region 
absorb all of our time and energy, no matter how important that region is. And she was talking specifically about the Middle East. And I have to wonder how successful Secretary Kerry was yesterday in explaining that thought to King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia. I hope he had an artful translation handy because I think he will have needed it. I will conclude by giving you my verdict on this neo-containment policy. That's my phrase. It's not the administration's. I think uh, they would shudder uh, at the thought of having it described that way. And in keeping with my emphasis on the personal, on how much what we think, experienced, do personally affects our policy views and those of our leaders. It's only fair to tell you that I voted not once but twice for President Obama. And as any, success, any sensible American would, I hope that his presidency is successful in restoring America's standing abroad and in restoring America's progress economically and socially at home. America must adapt and change to the changing world we live in, the changing world in which America will have relatively less power than it has had in the past four to five decades, but will continue to have more ability to influence world events than any other single nation or any other likely combination of nations. As a result of this change in the power equation, it is no longer possible or advisable to try to bottle up nations or regions, as Susan Rice comments suggest that the Obama administration will try to do. It is no longer possible or advisable to divide up the globe in power terms. The flaw in what may become known as the Rice Doctrine is its failure to integrate the Middle East an American policy in the greater Middle East, by that phrase I, I geographically mean essentially from Morocco through Iran. You can also do it on a on basis different than geography. It's failure to integrate the Middle East into a global strategy for managing change. Nixon and Kissinger had the advantage of being able to treat the Middle East and China, for example, when they inaugurated a new China policy, they were, had the advantage of operating in a neatly divided world of superpower interest, which they could play with. Fortunately, that day has passed, but it is also presented, as Jim Woolsey, the former head of the CIA, said, a change in the world situation in which the United States has gone from facing one mighty bear as its opponent or a dragon, I think he actually used the term, to thousands of little snakes crawling around and creating other and difficult problems. U.S. policymakers have to come to terms with the spread of globalization. They have, to a great extent, done that. They have also constructed sensible ideas about advancing contacts and dependencies throughout the world. But I fear they have failed to study as closely the reactions of much of the world through two dynamic and related phases, the reaction to globalization. Those two phases are what I think of as backlash and the subsequent era that we're experiencing now of counter-revolution that is becoming the defining political characteristic of our day. Those who are threatened by change, the kind of change that globalization represents, lash back against the forces, and yes, the nations that propel that change. And certainly the United States is in the forefront of doing that. The overarching struggle of our time is not America against Al-Qaeda, and it is certainly not Christianity against Islam. The important battle is no longer even among nation states, but is most often waged within states between forces that want to open to the broader world in all of its glories and tribulations, and those who want to close off their communities, however they define their community, to the forces of change. These latter feed on the resentments and hatreds of backlash. 
It's time for policymakers in Washington to also recognize that we live in a time of successful counter-revolution. Uh, the fact that the Arab Spring has taken place, the fact that the Soviet Union collapsed, that there was uh, great liberation in Eastern Europe and in the former Soviet states, has left an imprint of revolution. But now we've come to a time when the forces of counter-revolution are making their bid and scoring successes. Vladimir Putin in Russia was the first major person first major, a leader of a major country, to accomplish a counter-revolution and bring back old forces, but he stopped short of trying to restore the Soviet Union. But he did stop the wave of change that had swept through Russia, through Ukraine, and through many of the former Arab uh, Soviet states. The Arab Spring has been the next great moment of change and revolution, but now we see in Syria, certainly a counter-revolutionary effort to, to stop change. Egypt has gone back against a revolution that it found hard to digest. To some extent, something like this has happened in Tunisia, and Libya, of course, is always the exception. The chance to see something of how a modernizing country like Qatar reacts to these enormous pressures is part of what it makes, makes it such a pleasure to be back here for the first time since 1975. I'm not sure I can actually say that I came to Doha in 1975 when I compare what I see today to what I saw then. I think I should say I came to pre-Doha in 1975. And to see at this university the putting forward of the commonality of human experience in teaching here, in studying here, in living here. You all live part of that global change. I speak to you as a historical optimist. It's something that has framed, has supplied my own, the glass is half full frame of reference throughout my life. This springs in large part from having grown up, as I mentioned at the beginning, in times that no one should have had to suffer, in times that it should have not been, but were changed, finally, through enlightened political leadership in the United States. And I saw that experience repeated in South Africa, and I've seen it in other places as well. Winston Churchill once said of the United States that Americans will do the right thing after trying every other possible action. <laughs> I think that applies to the people of the world at large. And I think we're living through a time when much goes wrong. But I am confident that we will overcome those problems. And as I say, in looking at a, an institution like the one that Dean Noneman has overseen here, I take new hope. <laughs>